Chinese, Mr. Sildana, with me on behalf of all the uh, audience here to welcome you, being with us, although you, I know that you just arrived from England. Uh, okay, I should be close to the mic. Well, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Diana for being with us today. Although I know that she just arrived from outside Jordan, she was in England. And uh, welcome you all. And um, we will be tackling the thematic session that is dealing with the disaster risk reduction at heritage, heritage sites. And actually, I would like first to introduce myself and why I am here. And thanks for those who were selecting me to moderate this session. I'm Dr. Mundar Jamhawi, the Director General of the Department of Antiquities. And from the title of this session, that is the disaster risk reduction at heritage sites, you can realize that heritage sites are facing so many challenges and threats, either by nature or by human. And one of the procedures that always we should be dealing with is the measures and preparedness measures that should be taken in order to mitigate the dangers and the threats that be, uh, be uh, facing these sites. Our heritage sites in Jordan, if we actually, if we talk about the heritage of Jordan and see what important session was selected in this important World Science Forum conference, we can realize that, that such topic is, is very, very important to be tackled at research-wise, research level, as well as on, on, on the site, I mean, technically. Jordan is full of sites. Those who read the aerial photos and make archeological surveys mentioned that we have more than 100,000 sites in Jordan. 27,000 of them are registered through MEGA program right now and will be increasing accordingly. And some of these sites are listed in the World Heritage. We have four cultural sites listed in the World Heritage and one mixed as natural and cultural. One of these listed sites are Petra, where we will listen to a very, very important project implemented in Petra and tackling this important topic and session uh, of the session. One of the important issues I was discussing with the uh, presenters today before, the issue of decision making that is taken by, by planners and by developers. I think we are not only in Jordan. So many countries are facing problem of dealing with developers. They think they are developing for the needs and demands of the public, while in another way, they are creating problems and causes problems to our heritage. And there should be, a, 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 let me say, a line or a step where a balance should be occurred or should be created. I'm very honored today to welcome three important speakers. Coming, one coming from Europe, from Italy, another one coming from India, who's ECOMOS expert. And the third one, we, we actually consider here as Jordanian, more than Jordanians. <laughs> so let me first uh, welcome Dr. Rohat Gigasso from India. Rohit Jikasu is a conservation architect and risk management professional from India, currently working as UNESCO chair holder 
professor at the Institute of the Disaster Mitigation of Urban Cultural Heritage at Rus uh, Millikan University, Kyoto, Japan, and senior advisor at the Indian Institute of, for Human Settlements, and the trustee of the Indian Historical Cities Network Foundation. He is the elected president of ECOMOS India since 2014, and ECOMOS International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness since 2010. Rohit is also currently serving as an elected member of the Executive Committee of ECOMOS since 2011. Actually, it's long bio, but uh, very rich in experience. And I'm sure his lecture that will be entitled International Framework for Disaster Risk Ma Management for Cultural Heritage Challenges and Initiatives will be tackling the approach that is, uh, should be uh, taken uh, to face the challenges coming from uh, uh, disaster. Uh, Dr. Rohit, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, uh, to be able to present in front of you. Uh, I would like to first thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so what, uh, as our honorable chair has said, we am going to speak about the international framework for disaster risk management for cultural heritage uh, with several examples from around the world, especially in from Asia Pacific, where I'm uh, mostly working. Uh, so when we talk about disasters and heritage, uh, what we are really concerned about uh, is the impact that natural disasters have been making on heritage. And very recently, in fact, just two months ago, you must have heard about Mexico earthquake, where there was such a tremendous loss of heritage uh, that it was never even imagined. Uh, so many cathedrals, so many historic houses, monuments were, uh, were damaged uh, to an extent that it is really a challenge to recover, reconstruct them. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money and expertise to be able to do that uh, kind of job. Yeah, so just a few images of the kind of destruction that Mexico earthquake did uh, just in recent past. Well, uh, also let's look at the other examples. Uh, this is in Bagan, in Myanmar. And this is one of the sites which uh, the government of Myanmar wants to be inscribed on the World Heritage List. In fact, the work is going on right now. But look what happened just uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, huge uh, earthquake struck the region and 200 pagodas, pagodas are these monuments, these Buddhist stupas were, uh, were destroyed or damaged to great extent. Uh, just uh, to show you the kind of destruction uh, these pagodas or these monuments uh, suffered because of this uh, destructive earthquake. And just two and a half years ago, there was another earthquake in Nepal. Uh, you might have heard about uh, the two major uh, shakes uh, in April and May 2015, where World hated site of uh, Bhaktapur in Kathmandu Valley uh, was destroyed. Here you can see the kind of damage uh, the earthquakes did to this World Heritage uh, site. This is how it was before, and this is what was left after the earthquake. Not only monuments, but museums. And this is a national museum, uh, again in Nepal, where uh, this uh, historic building was the storage, where many collections were kept, and the collections kind of got trapped when the building uh, collapsed. And it was really difficult. There were many aftershocks coming. There were, uh, there was, it was monsoon time, so there were rainfall, and uh, there was a collateral damage, not only because of earthquake, but what happened uh, afterwards. Well, from uh, Nepal, uh, looking at another example in Kobe in Japan, where in 1995, in fact, this was one of the benchmark events which started this whole work towards heritage and disasters. Before that, there was very little awareness on what needs to be done at the scientific level, at the research level in this area. And not many initiatives had really taken place. But Kobe earthquake made us realize that actually disasters can cause tremendous loss to heritage. This is one of the museums in, in Kobe city, and you can see uh, in the display area and also in the storage area, a uh, lot of damage uh, uh, occurred to many of these collections. 
Well, when we think about uh, disasters, uh, we tend to think about earthquakes or floods or fires separately. But what we realize now is that disasters actually are not just uh, restricted to one hazard or earthquake or flood or fire, but they actually are, uh, there are many things which happen one after the other. So when there was an earthquake in, uh, in Japan, uh, there was a fire immediately afterwards. And you must have heard of a uh, recent tsunami in 2011, where there were not just uh, earthquake or tsunami, but there was oil uh, refinery caught fire, there was flooding, and of course you are all aware of the nuclear accident that happened, uh, that occurred because of this. So we are really dealing with these complex emergencies, complex disasters, uh, where many hazards actually uh, occur uh, in, in uh, parallel to each other or as a follow-up. So this is just uh, the example I just gave you on uh, the East Japan earthquake in 2011. Well, if we, if we uh, look at all the World Heritage Sites and try to uh, plot them against the earthquake hotspots uh, in the world, we actually realize that 40% of our World Heritage Sites, which are inscribed already, are very vulnerable to earthquakes. I mean, I'm talking about those which are highly vulnerable. Uh, there are others which are lesser, uh, vulnerable to the lesser extent, but, but it, it really points to us a big concern that even if damage has not occurred, there is a likelihood that a lot of damage will occur in the future if we don't take actions in advance in a proactive way. Uh, moving on from earthquakes, tsunami, I'm talking about another uh, another hazard which actually creates lots of disasters, and this is the world hated site of Lijiang in China, one of the most visited uh, sites in, in China. And uh, there has been four incidents of fires, and this is just one of the incidents. Uh, where a large part of the historic uh, area, uh, which is inscribed, is being burnt out. And again, because of the special characteristics, again, uh, we need to really understand how historic sites, historic buildings, historic settlements are created, are constructed, because a lot of damages occur because of the nature of their construction. For example, in this case, all the roofs are interconnected. So once there's a fire in one roof, it will jump off to the other roofs, and it's very difficult to control it. It, it works very differently than any new construction or any new, uh, new building. Okay, another example from Bhutan, uh, where again, uh, this, uh, uh, this is one of the monasteries which was supposed to be on the World Heritage List. In fact, Bhutanese government was preparing the nomination when uh, a major disaster struck, and, and this was uh, uh, damaged. Now, we should also realize that a lot of our, these heritage sites are lived in. I mean, people are using them on a day-to-day basis, sometimes for uh, worship, sometimes for pr praying or rituals, and sometimes also they are museums or, or, or palaces where people visit. Uh, so one has to really understand this living dimension of heritage and uh, the risks that result from, uh, from these, uh, these factors. Okay, another uh, example, uh, this is in Delhi, in the, in the middle of the city. Uh, the National Museum of Natural History uh, last year, I'm, I'm talking very recent disaster, was burnt out and 80% and of its fossil collections of very high value uh, was destroyed. And not to be, and it's just impossible to get it back. So I'm, I'm showing you these examples to, to really point out the gravity of the situation and the importance of uh, working in this area um, that we have uh, for a long time neglected. Okay, I don't know if you have uh, been uh, listening to the news, but even this year it happened, and last year there was one of the largest evacuation of collections from Louvre Museum after the World War. And that was not because of any uh, conflict or any, uh, any, any event uh, which is connected with uh, human intervention. It was purely because there was a lot of flooding, uh, and, and the museum... Uh, foreground was flooded and the, because the basement has storage, so a lot of collections were at high risk of being uh, damaged. And so they had to evacuate a lot of collections. So what we are also now realizing is that with the changing climatic pattern, we, our lot of our heritage sites, our heritage cities are extremely vulnerable to flooding. Uh, in fact, this situation is much more grave in urban areas because many of the historic urban areas where infrastructure is not able to really cope with that increased urbanization and the development which has destroyed the ecology of the place has, has created these uh, disasters. Uh, this is another event uh, uh, which I want to mention. It is a uh, world heritage site of Ayutthaya in Thailand. Again, there was huge, uh, heavy rainfall, and water just could not be, uh, you know, taken off the site. 
because of the development around this uh, World Heritage Site. So a lot of these issues are also connected with the way development happens inside and in the surrounding areas of our heritage site. So it's the, it, the issue is not just restricted to management of the site. This issue is also linked to the kind of development, urban development, the kind of uh, coordination between different stakeholders, which actually impacts the way sites become vulnerable. I have some examples that I'll show you in, uh, uh, in my uh, subsequent slides. This is a map which has been uh, prepared by the World Heritage, uh, sorry, by, by World Bank. And it shows all the world hated cities which are at high risk of flooding. And just look at the map. A lot of them, which are located, of course, along the coast or along the rivers, are highly vulnerable to floods. Uh, historically, they have been always uh, either coastal cities or cities which have been along the rivers. So with, the, with this uh, changing climate, you can see that these cities are going to be at higher risk than ever before. Okay, you must have heard about this hurricane that struck United States and also uh, there was another uh, hurricane, there were two, three hurricanes that uh, struck that part of the world and uh, one of the very important museum, uh, Rockport, and in fact there are many, many museums that have been damaged because of hurricane and we are now debating that why such f increased frequency of hurricanes and Unfortunately, the prediction says that this is going to be uh, increasing many fold. So what are we going to do to prepare for this eventuality that's uh, going to strike us? Hurricane Sandy, again in New York uh, in 2012, also destroyed a large part of the historic, part, uh, historic area in New York, and not because of flooding only, but because of fire. Because there was fire accompanying uh, this hurricane, and, and a large part of the wooden uh, houses uh, were, were just destroyed. Uh, okay, let's look at the other uh, phenomena that we see more and more now, again, as a result of climate change, and that's the cloudburst. You know, we find that suddenly there's a heavy downpour in a very limited time frame, and the average amount of rainfall is in fact a mo is is all squeezed into this small time gap, and this huge quantity of water, when it comes down, a large part of our traditional uh, buildings, of vernacular buildings, you know, which are made of, for example, in this case, they are made of uh, adobe or mud. They are not used to this kind of uh, changing climate, you know. So we find that there's a lot of damage happening because of this changing nature of uh, climate, which associated with either heavy rainfall, even. Uh, there are termites coming up where there were no, there were not termites before because the whole temperature and humidity conditions are are really changing, and so we have to really you know uh, try and do more research and understand what kind of phenomena is happening and try and deal with it in a more uh, proactive way. Uh, this is uh, in Greece where um, there has been bushfires, and we all know that there are increased incidents of fires in summer season where many forests are uh, catching fire and heritage sites which are located in the middle of dense forests are of course uh, vulnerable uh, because of this, uh, uh, these increased incidents of fire. So one thing that we need to really uh, look at is not just look at these events as events, but understand what are the factors that are increasing the vulnerability to disasters. And one of the factors, of course, as I mentioned just now, is climate change. And there's enough evidence for us to, to realize that the number of uh, hydrometeorological events, uh, uh, that is uh, floods or storms, droughts, are really increasing. And it's not just prediction, it's the reality. Now we have data to support that. Uh, there is an increase in instances of... Uh, so, of course, uh, the impact is going to be there, and it is already being seen. This is world hated city of Zanzibar in Africa, where, where we find now sea level rise, cyclones, and flooding all coming together and creating this kind of, a, a, you know, a very difficult situation which has to be addressed. Uh, but what, what is really important for us to first understand what is happening and then be able to develop adequate measures to deal with it. The other important phenomena that we must not forget when we think about vulnerability factors for heritage is increased urbanization. And if you see this graph, it just tells us the, the, the way urbanization is happening. The number of people living in urban areas is actually now more than in rural areas, and that says a lot about how it's impacting our heritage sites. You can just see the, the way it's increasing, and it is projected to increase in the future as well. See, people are migrating to cities. And what does it mean? And I just give you an example from Kyoto, which, is, uh, which has around 11 world heritage sites in the middle of the city. So this was Kyoto in 1890. 
very small area but then what happened if you look at uh, the way Kyoto has expanded especially expanded over last hundred years many of those heritage sites which were out of the urban area is now engulfed with urbanization and that has a, a very very strong impact on the vulnerability of these heritage sites because they are now being exposed to the access is very poor if you see like this was the area you can see how much it has expanded in just a span of 100 years so uh, so what we now realize is that there is a very difficult situation where the access is poor fire engines cannot just come in because the the roads are very narrow so we have to find out ways in which you know there is a localized uh, emergency provision and rather than relying off on on external uh, uh, services being brought in uh, I bring you back to this site I just mentioned to you where the flooding happened and I just want to show you uh, what is the real problem here I mean there is a it was an island where the whole ecology is being destroyed because of the urban development around it and because of the urban development and along with that and you can see the historic map of that settlement there were many canals and many of those canals have been filled up so the traditional supply system of water is no longer functioning so you have two things happening on one hand the traditional water system has stopped functioning on the other hand the whole ecology of that space of the of the surrounding area has been disturbed because of urbanization so it's not just a problem of uh, of heritage management it's a problem of larger development and the impact that that larger development has on many of our historic cities and this is important for us and this is what you can see how there was a traditional water system there were gates which controlled the inlet and outlet of water but then now these have been built on and so they don't function as they were intended to be and on the, at the same time you can see that the frequency of floods this is for one of the heritage sites in Thailand which I just talked about where the frequency is really increasing and 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 you see the the combined result of all that um, so uh, it is important for us and I want to highlight that there's not much research done in this area and I think we need to really do uh, much more on the interface of disaster risks climate change and ill-conceived development uh, we have done re research in specific areas but they are separated from each other it is actually ironic that even disaster risk management and climate change fields have not worked together much uh, and even no, only now there is a increasing realization but there's a much more work that needs to be done um, this is uh, uh, the other factor where we need to really understand this is more heritage related uh, specific factor is the importance of understanding past interventions because a lot of vulnerabilities are created because of additions and alterations that have been done to heritage sites in Myanmar when there, were, there was an earthquake last year we have just recognized that a lot of these additions were done in uh, reinforced concrete and the original structures were in load bearing brick walls so when you have these kind of incompatible additions there is going to be a, 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 an effect which is not desirable so I want to really emphasize this part which uh, we have neglected uh, for so long but we really need to work on this uh, we need to work on an integrated framework for disaster risk management for heritage which talks about multiple hazards not just talk about earthquakes or floods or fire in isolation but think about all those factors uh, hazards that are affecting the heritage sites multiple vulnerabilities uh, vulnerability is not just physical but also social and economic and institutional because maybe even if we only focus on physical and not focus on the social and the economic dimensions I, uh, we are not going to really make a lot of difference so when we think about vulnerabilities we also have to consider uh, the multiple uh, dimensions of vulnerabilities uh, we have to think about the degree of exposure a lot of our heritage sites are inhabited by poor and marginalized people and when we talk about disaster risk management we have to also address uh, you know the specific issues which uh, are they don't have enough resources to really maintain so how are we going to manage that all these issues have to uh, have to uh, be considered and then think about potential impacts on heritage attributes and associated values of course we are concerned about that but also on people's safety on economy and livelihoods and also on the social structure so it requires a holistic understanding if we have to really work on disaster risk management and not just uh, very uh, focused on uh, only one dimension and also I would like to emphasize that when we think about disaster risk management we should not of course we need to think about prevention mitigation 
preparedness, response, recovery, all these are important aspects. But we have realized from Nepal earthquake, from Myanmar earthquake, from what has happened in Italy, that if we let disasters happen, it is extremely, extremely difficult to re recover heritage once it is damaged and destroyed. So it's very important for us to focus a lot more on prevention and mitigation. If we invest in that, although we don't, uh, human psychology doesn't enable us to really focus on what has not happened, we react only when something hits us. But if we think in the economic sense, it is much more uh, advisable to really focus a lot on the prevention and mitigation uh, aspect and not really let disasters happen. So uh, in the last part of my presentation, I want to uh, talk about the key global initiatives that we have been uh, uh, taking up uh, recently. Uh, one of the pioneering initiative which has been led by UNESCO and uh, which has been, uh, you know, they, they adopted a strategy uh, for risk reduction at World Heritage Properties uh, almost eight years ago. And, uh, and then a resource manual on disaster risk management in World Heritage Properties has been developed by UNESCO. It gives a whole methodological framework on how to achieve this, starting from risk assessment to, to really uh, designing solutions for reducing risks, uh, responding and, uh, and recovering from them. And then there have been some very practical initiatives that have been taken up in many historic World Heritage Sites, which needs to be looked at as examples, as lessons that we can learn from. This is from Ayutthaya, which I mentioned before, where this kind of uh, flood mitigation has been designed to respond to the landscape value of the site. So rather than having a permanent barrier, you have collapsible barrier, which in the normal situations doesn't disturb the landscape character. But once you have a warning system in place, you can actually uh, erect them, and then it prevents the site from getting flooded. Some very interesting initiatives in Japan, uh, where uh, from uh, there have been these uh, kind of uh, initiatives to of uh, installing uh, hydrants in historic preservation districts. And if you look at the way they are designed, they don't disrupt, disturb the, the character of the historic area. And at the same time, they also involve local communities because many of the communities have to be involved. If you don't do that, you can't rely on heritage managers. They are anyways not enough to, to deal with the situation. So this has been extremely successful in one of the world heritage site of Kiyomizudera in, in Kyoto in Japan. Um, some other examples, again, uh, showing how you can have these hydrants which respect the, the character, you know, so we are not using red boxes which destroy the the value of the site, but really make them in, uh, compatible with the with the local uh, uh, local conditions. Another very interesting initiative that has been uh, taken up in Japan is the creation of this underground uh, water tank. So you rather you know, as I mentioned, it is very difficult for fire engines to come in. So why don't create a local water source and have water rainwater getting collected there? So under this. Uh, this ground, which is in the buffer area of the World Heritage Site, there is a wa water is collected here, and when there is a fire, this local source of water can be used rather than relying on 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 an external source, and it all works with gravity. So again, another thing that we have to consider is that we can't rely too much on technology because technology fails in disasters. So this works totally on gravity, uh, the the local gravitational force, and that uh, that really makes it uh, helpful. Uh, very quickly, some uh, of the initiatives on emergency response. So how are we well prepared in our heritage sites to really be, uh, respond when there's a disaster? Do we have uh, telephone numbers of the, uh, the fire officers? Of the, in many cases, it is not existing. The communication is not there. So how do we create communication? How do we do various drills? Drills not only to save people's lives, but also to rescue heritage. You know, you have to salvage it when, and how, what kind of procedures you develop in order to do that. How do you coordinate with civic defense or civic protection agencies? And we have an uh, example, the next presentation will talk about it. And there are some key lessons from Nepal where we were engaged after the earthquake, where the, this kind of a collaboration is really, really important uh, if we have to make a difference. This is a collaboration with military to deal with heritage. Uh, in disaster situations. Like you can see how they are actually helping in the re recovery after the earthquake, uh, in response after the earthquake. This is the, a very important uh, 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 throne which is uh, being rescued from a, a collapsed building uh, after the earthquake. 
and training of the museum staff, uh, documentation and storage of salvage fragments. So I'm quickly showing you uh, these just to show you that there are a lot of initiatives that have been taken up and these need to be multiplied. The lessons from these have to be dis uh, disseminated further. Uh, and then I conclude uh, by uh, mentioning about this important framework that has been adopted in 2015. This is the Sendai framework, which for the first time in an international disaster management policy, heritage figures as a prominent sector. This is a huge, huge achievement for us because this actually uh, says that uh, we really need to uh, integrate heritage in our disaster management policies, which becomes uh, important. And there are three important elements that I want to mention. Uh, promoting culture of disaster prevention, incorporating culture in DRR or disaster risk reduction actions, and strong call for cultural heritage protection. Uh, so there is, a, uh, there is a very clear statement in this international disaster management policy, which talks about including heritage, documenting heritage, documenting the lost uh, heritage suffers due to disasters, because we don't even have the data. And I think a lot of work really needs to be done in, in creating that data sets of the damage and losses to heritage. And we don't have that. I mean, it is ironic that very little data in a systematic way exists, which can be really uh, used to develop our procedures. So this is one of the initiative that has resulted from Sendai framework. And we have been, we have been working on it in India for last uh, one and a half years, where we have been working towards developing a national policy on disaster risk management of museums. And this initiative is not taken by Ministry of Culture. This is taken by National Disaster Management Authority, which I think is a good thing, because it means that it is not just ownership with the Ministry of Culture, with the culture sector, but disaster management sector takes it on as one of the sectors for which they have to uh, come up with. So there are these uh, two guidelines, which are available online, which you can also uh, 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 visit and, and, and refer. One is on the cultural heritage sites and precincts, and the other one is on the on the museums. So, uh, so I, I feel that there's a lot of work that we need to work on, need to do. I'll just quickly jump to the last slide because this is what I would like to conclude with, and that is on. Mm, just a second. <laughs> These few points which I mentioned, uh, no. uh, which I feel are very important for us. Uh, to consider where we need to go from here. Uh, we need to focus a lot on mitigation and adaptation strategies for reducing disaster risk to cultural heritage that are integrated with planning and development process. This is one of the things that I would like to highlight. Enhanced preparedness, instead of only focusing on response and recovery, very important for us to really work in that area. Synergy between disaster risk management of immovable and movable cultural heritage. I feel this is another area we haven't worked. Either museum sector has worked separately than the site sector, and there has to be a uh, more and more cooperation between them. Uh, synergy between disaster risk management of cultural and natural site. Because again, these two areas have not functioned together, and really need to work uh, more and more on, uh, in a collaboration. A uh, more focus on linking post-disaster response and recovery with disaster risk reduction. You know, recovery doesn't end in recovery. It has to lead to the preparedness for the next disaster. And that thinking has not really uh, been there much in our recovery operations. So we have to make that connect. Uh, and of course, uh, although we have progressed much more, we need to have an increased cooperation between heritage sector and civic defense or protection agencies and other humanitarian actors. I think we still need to have more cooperation uh, between these two sectors. And uh, lastly, I would mention that we should address complex events. We, we should not have these artificial divide between natural and uh, human induced because they are all connected to each other. And with conflicts, more and more conflict coming in, um, we need to really look at them together uh, and not just focus only on the natural or the, or the human numbers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gicasso, for this interesting presentation where you tackled the issue of disaster preparedness from a worldwide uh, uh, view. Although each country has its own particularity in, in, in the type of hazards uh, facing its heritage, uh, and I find that in Jordan maybe we have different types of uh, disasters that, but the approach you were raising, 
dealing with whatever the disaster is in terms of understanding the event first, then controlling the urbanization, then understanding the past interventions, I think it's essential. And uh, if, we up, if, if we apply this approach on whatever, uh, we may get into uh, a good strategy in the prevent prevention and uh, the mitigation measures that should be taken. Uh, we are in Jordan very much interested in, in, in this issue because, um, you know, to talking about a disaster means that priority should be given first. And I think uh, uh, maybe uh, the audience has some questions. We will open for 10 more minutes for questions if anyone uh, has, please. Yes, please. Forgive me, sir. Can I congratulate you on the most wonderful presentation? It was a really encompassing, facilitating, and reflective. So thank you so much. I am so pleased that you too like the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. But I wonder if you have seen in the February the 2nd, 2017, agreement that was adopted at the General Assembly that there is now an indicator on cultural heritage. So we actually have to measure it Absolutely. to 2030. So I think there is a real opportunity to work across the world and the national governments to deliver the results on the impact of disasters on cultural heritage. We're probably going to be looking at the tangible, just as you've described, rather than the intangible, but I think it's going to be such an important step forward and it would be brilliant to work with you in partnership if there's any way we can take this forward. There's a wonderful IAP initiative on trying to build a better resource um, through the National Academy of Science in, in Italy, in Rome, at the Dince, and it may be something we could offer as a useful link. Thank you. I think, yes, absolutely. Look forward. Sorry, my name is Virginia Murray. I come from Public Health England, but I've been working closely with you and ISDR. Forgive me. Also, I'd like to thank you so much for this great presentation. But as His Excellency mentioned, we here in our region, we are facing more risks which that completely different than what is going on in India or Southeast Asia. Indeed, uh, you tackled uh, vernacular buildings, museum buildings. This means architecture. Uh, in addition to museums and this and that. But in my point of view, the most important thing is to conserve, preserve also the archaeological sites. Because those sites, they are the stores of the archaeological objects which they are on display at the museums. Sure. And it's not only in Jordan, but all over the world. Yes. Those sites are facing or threatened by demolition mostly. Uh, not only by natural uh, causes, but also by human uh, reasons. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Absolutely Zedan. Absolutely important. I agree with you. Totally agree with you. Who else? There's a... Sorry. Please. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if we can concentrate on the pre-intervention rather than the post-intervention for retrofitting and assessing the yeah. cultural heritage. Yeah. This will add so much to our aim. Thank you. Uh, if I can just reflect on that, I think this is a very important point. Uh, we still have to develop technologies uh, where we can retrofit uh, because traditional constructions and historic constructions are very different than new constructions. So we need to understand them first. I think we haven't understand them, not only from the point of view of construction, but also their failure mechanism. Because the failure of traditional construction is very different than any modern construction. So our interventions have to really ad address that kind of a uh, pattern. So a lot of work really needs to be done. I agree, absolutely. Dr. Najib. Uh, for the interpreters, can you lower uh, uh, your voice because 
Mm. Please, thank you. Shukran. Dr. Najib. Uh, you emphasized uh, the heritage aspect and the preservation of heritage. I would like you also to emphasize the human factor, uh, which, is, which will be translated into uh, or can be achieved by the preparedness. Sure. Uh, really sound preparedness. It's not only preparedness uh, in, uh, within the people, but the preparedness, uh, as for example, in Jordan, we have now a university which is specializing in uh, this kind of problems, which is the King of the King, uh, Prince Al Hussein. Uh, uh, no, no, college for uh, civil uh, civil defense or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. uh, so as to, to, to prepare the people too. We cannot only prepare the future uh, relying on ad hoc World Bank reports. What is your experience in this domain? Can we rely on these reports? No, really? you, we can. When, when I saw your map talking about extreme <laughs> problems in our region, uh, I can't trust that. What's your See, opinion? I, I, I feel that uh, there are two points to this. Uh, we can say one of the things we may question is well, how much is the sound uh, basis of this? And the other is how much awareness this raises among us. So I don't see this, these maps as, uh, as uh, saying that whether it has been done statistically correct or not. I think that's another question we may need to answer question. But I always feel that uh, at least there is an increase uh, evidence uh, for us to really be sensitive about and do something about it. At least we now know that there are many, many world heritage cities which are extremely vulnerable and there is, maybe the data is not exactly correct and it has not been done in a sound way, but at least these, uh, this kind of uh, awareness should be there and we need to do more research. I agree with you. It is not something we can accept as it is. We need to do much more research and coming back to World Bank, uh, many cases what i have found also is that when we have these experts coming in and doing the damage assessment the criteria that is used is not sound because it is using the same criteria for the old buildings and for the new buildings and then you make these categories as the safe and unsafe and uh, which is as which is not correct because the the you have to address apples and oranges cannot be uh, combined together and seen so there are a lot of questions on that scientific uh, you know, validity of the way things are done. But my point here was not to say that they are done in a right way, but at least they point us to the issues at hand, but we need to do a lot more work. Uh, and more work at the localized level rather than at the global level, because uh, you know, even the damage and loss assessments cannot be done at the global level. We have to do it regionally according to different typologies. Uh, so there's a lot of work, I agree with you. I mean, I, I don't yeah. want to just accept it. Okay, last question, because we don't have enough time. Uh, thank you um, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I would like to uh, uh, jump on your last slide and where you say, you yes. know, where do you need to go from here? Um, how do you see the um, uh, synergy between uh, the, the, your third point, the immovable and movable cultural right. heritage sites? I think that's really probably something very important for Jordan. Um, you know, uh, you yes. movable elements, yes. uh, museums, yes. archaeological so, sites, and immovable. How would you see that going yes. forward? Yes. Let me answer this uh, from my own experience in Nepal. Yeah. Because uh, what happened was that I showed you this example where a building was badly damaged and there were collections inside. And we had three different players. We had engineers and architects who were only interested in the building and had, didn't care uh, anything about what is inside. We had museum uh, curators who were only interested in the collections inside the museum, but didn't care about where they are kept, how they are, you know, what is the access to them, nothing. And we had all the uh, disaster management or response agencies, which were only interested to clear the space so that they can perform recovery operations. They were not interested in movable or immovable, at, uh, uh, of course. So what we had to really do is to get these engineers and architects to so sit well. together with conservators. And another thing that happened was that the inventory of that collection got buried in the building itself. So they didn't even have access to the database of which collection is where, what size it is. And we realized that it is so important, even if you have to do shoring, to design a shoring to get in to, to take those objects out, you really need to have that kind of close cooperation between the, those working with the building and those working with the inside collections, you know. And what has happened ironically is that the disaster management initiatives for museums have gone ahead in one direction, 
and they have done a lot of work and the, uh, those with sites have worked also in their own direction but now there is a, a growing need uh, in the reality on the ground many of our museums are site museums so you really need to look at them together and not uh, look at them separately so uh, absolutely uh, an important area to work on well thank you very much because we time is uh, yeah. we are strict with the time and uh, actually it's more um, more than one uh, what should be given for the first uh, uh, presenter but uh, the topic was interesting we will go ahead to the second spe speaker uh, who is dr morano dolce from italy and will uh, be talking uh, or his uh, presentation in, is entitled with civil protection in the prevention and response to natural disasters, the case uh, of Italy. Uh, it's uh, important to say that Dr. Dolce is the Director Gen General uh, and the Professor of Structural Engineering um, uh, in University of Nablus, Federico, and uh, is at present Director General at the Italian Department of Civil Protection, where he was head of Sesimic and Volcanic Risk Office uh, and is now scientific consultant. Uh, Dr. Dolce, the floor is yours, please. Again, <laughs> I think you have uh, heard. Uh, so, good morning again. <coughs> I'm very happy to be here to give this presentation. And uh, uh, I will, uh, uh, I, I think it is a, a good follow up of the first presentation because we will focus on uh, some <coughs> practical problems uh, regarding these, uh, the first two topics that are in, uh, uh, listed in this summary. The, the first is the emergency management of the uh, recent uh, and uh, some way perhaps ongoing uh, central Italy seismic sequence. <coughs> and the second is uh, the seismic prevention of cultural heritage in Italy, looking especially focusing on, uh, on uh, uh, concepts and uh, uh, criteria that are uh, used. <coughs> and uh, finally, I will uh, give a, a very short overview on the PROMEDE project uh, which is a, a, a European Union project that involves also Jordan besides <coughs> Italy as uh, uh, the leader country and uh, Palestine and Israel. Let me start with uh, the Italian uh, uh, Central, Itali uh, Central Italy sequence uh, with the earthquake that occurred on the 24th of August uh, 2016, magnitude 6. Uh, it was not such a big earthquake, but uh, as uh, every time an earthquake occurs in Italy, there are uh, very big damage, and uh, especially three small uh, villages were uh, stricken by this earthquake, uh, which reached the, the, uh, an intensity of the uh, degree 10, 11 on the mercalli cancani Siber scale. Uh, there were, unfortunately, uh, almost 300 fatalities and uh, about 40 uh, hospitalized injured people. <coughs> and uh, uh, this earthquake occurred at 3.36. Uh, unfortunately, this was not the only earthquake, and until June 2017, we had uh, 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 many earthquakes at 70,000 events. Uh, of course, only Two of them were of magnitude greater than six, and I have to mention especially the one that occurred on the 30th of November uh, in uh, Norcia, which is some 10 kilometers from, uh, from uh, Amatrice Accumuli. Uh, as you can see here, this was the first on 24th of August, and this is the second on the 30th of September. Uh, uh, earthquake with a magnitude greater than six. <coughs> and uh, there were many other, uh, nine, uh, in total nine earthquakes with, with magnitude greater than five, 
and with the subsequence uh, which occurred around the 18th of January uh, 2017 with four earthquakes of magnitude greater than five in just uh, uh, three, four hours. So <coughs> uh, there were four regions involved and the emergency management, I can assure you, that was uh, quite uh, complicated. Here you see uh, the diagram of the, uh, of the number of earthquakes uh, uh, per day, and you see the earthquake with magnitude greater than two anyway, and uh, you see the three uh, big peaks on the uh, 24th of August, on the uh, 26th and 30th of October, because even on 26th of October there was a 5.9 magnitude earthquake, and on the 18th of January. And I would like to also to underline for what concerns multi-hazard problems, that uh, just uh, starting on the 16th of January, there was a very big snow fall uh, with a return period of the order <coughs> of 50 or 100 uh, years, and we had many problems also in managing this uh, other kind of uh, emergency. <coughs> just to have an idea of the impact of these uh, many earthquakes, uh, here you see the final uh, macroseismic field map <coughs> that, uh, uh, of course, macroseismic means that it is, it is based on the damage. And uh, uh, you, you see that uh, uh, looking at the area that was interested by a ma an intensity, Mercalli intensity, greater or equal, the, uh, greater than or equal to seven, uh, this area is about 70 by 30 kilometer. <coughs> big. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, just to give an idea of the damage, you have uh, already seen the uh, aerial, ma uh, aerial view of Amatrice, and before the earthquake, the first earthquake, this is after the first earthquake with intensity uh, evaluated to be between 10 and 11, and uh, uh, the following is... Uh <coughs> after the event of the 30th of October uh, when the intensity was definitely uh, evaluated to be 11. Uh, some <coughs> pictures from the ground uh, just after the 24th of August and you see the very big damage, disruption, and uh, uh, also you can uh, uh, judge the very bad quality of, uh, uh, of the meson reconstruction and or the masonry itself. And here you see some uh, churches, some uh, towers, <coughs> always in Amatrice. And after the uh, October 30 earthquake that occurred at 7.40 in the morning, uh, uh, we had uh, many uh, churches collapsed in, uh, in Norcia. <coughs> Here you see uh, four, the, the, the most important uh, ones, uh, <coughs> San Filippo Neri, San Benedetto, San Francesco, and Santa Maria Argentia. <coughs> so I, I, I would like to uh, give you an idea of how the civil protection uh, system works in Italy. Uh, when we say civil protection, we uh, mean uh, the ensemble of the activities that are put in place to protect life, goods, settlements, and environments from damage and risk of damage due to, due to disaster. And uh, uh, I have to emphasize that in Italy, civil protection is not a task that is assigned to a single administration, it's not a ministry, but is a, a complex function which is played by a complex system. And this complex <laughs> system is called the National Service of Civil Protection. It is established by a law that was uh, <coughs> enforced in 1992. And uh, this, uh, this system is uh, made of uh, uh, all the ministries uh, all the uh, local administration, regions, provinces, and municipalities with all their uh, operational structures. So there, are, there is the National Firefighters Corp, the police, the prefectures that belong to the Ministry of Interiors. 
and so there are uh, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Carabinieri that belongs to the Ministry of Defense, but there is also the uh, national, the scientific community, uh, the National Institute of, of Geophysics, the National Council of Research, and so on and so forth, that uh, <coughs> are uh, affiliated to the University of, uh, uh, to the Ministry of uh, uh, University and Research. So, <coughs> moreover, and, and all this system is coordinated by the Civil Protection Department that operate on behalf of the Prime Minister of the Presidency of the Council of Ministers. And also I have to mention the volunteers. In Italy there are 4,000 civil protection volunteers organization and uh, for a total number of around 1,200,000 volunteers and the mandate of this service is uh, to deal with uh, forecasting and warning prevention and mitigation rescue and assistance and emergency overcoming so it's a very wide spectrum the entire cycle of uh, uh, of risk that is dealt with by uh, this service just to uh, let you know how it works i will focus of course uh, on the on the emergency on the recent emergency management. So at uh, uh, 4 a.m. the earthquake occurred at 3:36, and after half an hour, the operational committee meeting was convened. And around this big table that you see here, there are all the uh, representative of the uh, national service, uh, national uh, civil protection service. So you see the firefighters uh, here on the left, the army, the air force, the carabinieri, and also the, uh, the scientific community that is represented here and other, <coughs> other representatives. After four days, we establish the uh, national coordination system on site, which is called uh, the Direction of Command and Control, DCOMAC. And uh, it started to work uh, uh, at 12 o'clock of the 28th of August. And uh, how, it, how does it work? Uh, the uh, DCOMAC is organized in operational functions that you can see listed on the left-hand side of this slide. Uh, and uh, uh, around the function, there are the different components of the, the civil protection system that uh, are uh, working together. So there are uh, the function uh, related to, pref uh, for example, the volunteers, the press and communication, the plan planning and technical unit, uh, schools, and of course, cultural heritage that you see here as the last function in this list. <coughs> now, I don't, uh, uh, I cannot, uh, 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 speak in general of the different uh, functions that have been uh, uh, carried out. Just uh, uh, I will focus on the cultural heritage, um, emergency management, which was, which was really very complex. As you can imagine, any time we have uh, an earthquake or any other kind of uh, uh, natural event in Italy, uh, we are uh, fortunately plenty of, uh, of cultural heritage and so we have uh, inevitably uh, big consequences of, on uh, cultural heritage, both uh, immovable and uh, movable. And so uh, after uh, the August 24, we had uh, already many uh, problems and we will see some figures afterwards, but uh, especially after the uh, two earthquakes, uh, October 26 and uh, October 30, the, uh, the uh, area was so um, much extended with respect to the uh, first earthquake that we had to uh, speed up um, many procedures. But uh, uh, I was speaking of that. Okay, <coughs> uh, which are uh, the <coughs> main topics in the emergency management of cultural heritage? Here uh, you have uh, six topics that uh, are to be managed, the assessment of damage and usability of uh, immovable, let's say, uh, cultural heritage, churches, historical palaces, and uh, other heritage manifests uh, like uh, walls, like towers, and so on, and so forth. The displacement and the sheltering of mobile heritage, the artworks, 
at risk, the evaluation of safety condition and execution of safety countermeasures, the protection of mobile heritage using temporary coverage, uh, the uh, securing of heritage debris, this is also a very big problem. We have a big amount of debris and uh, they, have to, they cannot be uh, simply uh, throw out. And uh, also the making, uh, uh, making a cost analysis of uh, damage. So uh, one of these activity is the post-earthquake damage uh, usability assessment cultural heritage. We have a procedure that are well established in uh, decree of the prime minister. Uh, and uh, uh, we are making use uh, uh, of uh, this uh, uh, form, which is uh, made of about 12 pages. And uh, just to uh, cons consider uh, there are three or four pages that are relevant to uh, collapse mechanism. I will speak of, uh, of uh, this uh, just in a few minutes. <coughs> and that this was for churches and these are this is the form for policies. <coughs> uh, the total number of inspections uh, for damage evaluation was of the order of 5,000, and uh, uh, about half of the buildings were uh, damaged, about half of them were not damaged. <coughs> uh, but the, the, the problem is that uh, after uh, the second uh, uh, big earthquake on the 30th of October, we had to restart again, uh, while uh, before 30th of October, about 1,000 inspections had been made. And uh, <coughs> the same occurred after the uh, 18th of January. So uh, at the end, uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, buildings that were inspected were, was of the order of 3,500, but the number of inspection in total was 5,000. <coughs> the recovery of movable cultural heritage, we had to uh, recover about 15,000 pieces from 355 damaged buildings and also about 7,000 books and 2 kilometers, 0.75, uh, 750 uh, meters of archives. Uh, then the, the, there was a problem of securing the movable culture. So the actors were mixed teams of cultural heritage experts, fire brigades, police uh, forces, and uh, civil protection volunteers. There are lots of activities that are listed here, but uh, there is no time to go into details. And uh, I have only five minutes. It's uh, terrible. <laughs> OK. <coughs> Safety countermeasure here as a symbol. You can see the uh, propping of the San Benedetto uh, church that collapsed uh, almost uh, all, uh, but the facade uh, was preserved by the earthquake, so it had to be uh, preserved with uh, propping. And uh, <coughs> uh, other safety countermeasures uh, were also the coverage of uh, uh, the ruins of the uh, end of the debris of uh, uh, collapsed buildings. <coughs> Uh, I can go on, and I want to speak uh, just of some concepts that are being introduced in Italy about seismic vulnerability, or, uh, about seismic prevention of heritage buildings. First of all, let's consider the seismic vulnerability of heritage buildings, especially churches that are very, very vulnerable for their, uh, for their uh, let's say, configuration, architectural consideration. Uh, configuration. And uh, uh, here just uh, some examples of a collapse mechanism that you are, uh, you see depicted in the middle of the, of the slides, and some uh, uh, typical example of this kind of uh, collapse mechanism. There are, as I show you in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the form, a, a collection of these uh, mechanisms, and uh, it, so it is uh, uh, easily easy to classify which is the kind of mechanism that can be uh, can interest a certain type of, of building. So the same uh, holds for palaces uh, with different collapse mechanisms. 
And uh, a, a, a very big problem is also the very bad quality of measuring in many, in many cases. And uh, this uh, can uh, produce a kind of collapse which is not uh, a fallout of uh, a facade, but uh, really the, uh, the, the, the crumbling of the masonry. Uh, in the past, uh, after uh, uh, past earthquake, for example, in 1979 in Umbria or 1997, uh, there were many uh, uh, retrofit or uh, improving uh, seismic resistance uh, interventions that were made by using heavy reinforced concrete floors, heavy uh, reinforced concrete tie beams, and uh, uh, the effect was uh, uh, sometimes or quite often uh, not uh, uh, positive, as you can see in these slides. Also, the use of reinforced mortar injection uh, is uh, not positive in many, in many situations, as well as, but this is perhaps not the case of uh, uh, cultural heritage in, in, in uh, some uh, situations, is uh, the use of uh, um, injecting of, uh, of walls. So, <coughs> current strengths of, uh, of uh, uh, current trends of uh, strengthening interventions, there is a <coughs> Uh, a, a very uh, big international interest on the subject, so you see some uh, <coughs> documents documents that are produced by RILEM, ECOMOS, uh, the CEN, uh, CEN, European Committee for Standardization, International Organization for Standardization, the Italian uh, UNI, and so on and so forth, but in Italy we uh, have uh, uh, these guidelines that uh, have been uh, um, produced by the uh, Ministry of Cultural Heritage along with the Civil Protection Department and the Minister of Public Works. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the summary of uh, these guidelines. <coughs> I want to also emphasize that I, they are consistent with the National Building Standards uh, of 2008 Italian Building Standards that uh, uh, have a, a specific uh, uh, chapter related to uh, existing buildings and uh, uh, leave the possibility of uh, uh, looking at the conservation of cultural heritage as well as the uh, strengthening of them. Here you see some uh, uh, topics that are dealt with uh, I, and uh, perhaps I better I show you uh, this uh, slide that uh, uh, provides the list of the types of interventions that are dealt with in the guidelines, especially connections, uh, um, arches and vaults, uh, floor, uh, uh, the, the, the treatment of floor flexibility, and so on and so forth. Just to conclude, uh, so the chairman is uh, happy. <laughs> I will uh, uh, just give you some uh, ideas about the PROMEDE project that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. Uh, this is uh, a project that is uh, funded by the European Commission and uh, Ita Italy is uh, the Sea Protection Department is the leader of the project and it involves four partners, four Mediterranean National Civil Protection Authorities, Cyprus Civil Defense, National Emergency Management Agency of Israel, uh, the Palestinian Civil Defense, and uh, the Jordan Civil Defense. Uh, the total budget is uh, one, uh, more than one million, and uh, the <coughs> financial contribution from the European Commission is 800,000 euros. The duration is 24 months. It started last year, and uh, it should uh, and uh, at, uh, on July uh, 2018. So, <coughs> uh, the f the, the, these uh, civil protection authorities, uh, uh, the, the, the aim of the project uh, is to strengthen disaster preparedness capacities for responding to natural man made disasters and to implement common tools and methods to safeguard cultural heritage. And this is all consistent with the civil protection, European civil protection mechanism. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason why Italy is leader is because uh, since 2005, the Italian civil protection uh, uh, introduced the safeguarding of cultural heritage in uh, 
uh, exercise that uh, are funded by European Union. I have not the time to uh, go uh, into the detail. I just uh, would like to emphasize that one of the objectives is to set up a pool of experts for each uh, uh, country that is able to operate in the aftermath of a disaster for assessment and safeguard of cultural heritage and to establish standard operating procedures. <clears throat> so uh, these are the main areas of intervention, research and study, technical assistance, module development according to the Union Civil Protection Mechanism regulatory framework, and finally to make some exercise at local le level, at uh, international level. Uh, we are more or less at the mid of the middle of the program, perhaps something ahead to the middle. And uh, uh, the program, uh, as you can see, includes uh, uh, national exercises, international simulation exercise, and finally workshop about the lessons learned and the final conference. Thank you for your attention. Mm. 25 minutes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Dolce, for this interesting presentation again. Uh, it seems very uh, well that Italy has reached to well-developed uh, and mature procedures for uh, disaster and especially for earthquake uh, disasters. Uh, I'll actually also it's very clear that we are in need to initiate the guidelines that clarify the procedures that should be taken in terms of this in Jordan. I'll uh, give not 10 minutes, five minutes, but uh, before that, for those who are invited for the private lunch, they can stay with us till uh, 1.30 because we have received the message that we can extend it more, uh, half an hour more, so we can move from here at uh, 1.30. So don't worry for those who are invited for the private lunch. I will open the floor to uh, uh, questions for four uh, or five uh, more minutes. Dr. Zidane, please. We can need the last uh, slide where the uh, building will right. be instructed. And you, you have to wait, otherwise they cannot to talk later. You, you, you can speak on uh, the You have to talk by a uh, big okay. My question is, you kindly showed us a slide where the buildings or the structures were uh, heavily destructed by the earthquake. Do you think that the reason behind this very huge destruction is the earthquake itself or the material which was the buildings were built of or the architecture of those buildings? So if the reason was number two, then I think we have to intervene before the uh, earthquakes will happen. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I uh, have to specify that uh, I showed distracted buildings, but there were, the, or there are, perhaps so 2,000 damaged buildings, uh, not uh, collapsed buildings, and uh, even uh, uh, in uh, conditions when uh, the local intensity was not so big. So, of course, uh, it was uh, uh, perhaps difficult to preserve uh, San Benedetto di Norcia in Norcia, that was the epicenter of the 6.5 magnitude earthquake, to preserve this church from damage or from collapse. Uh, but uh, there were many situations or around uh, even 50 or 100 kilometers from the epicenter where uh, churches were severely damaged. And this should not happen, because if you uh, take some countermeasure, if, if you make some uh, strengthening intervention that are compatible with the uh, architectural characteristics, I'm, I don't, I, I'm not saying that you have to put reinforced concrete uh, in these churches. Uh, so uh, the, the earthquake in Amatrice uh, and Accumuli was very, very strong 
we have uh, uh, accelerometric records that uh, uh, testify the, the violence of this earthquake. But uh, far away from the epicenter, we had big damage that uh, could be contrasted with very, bad, very, very well designed uh, uh, strengthening interventions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mauro, thank you very much for, as always, a uh, very informative presentation. I, will ha I, I have a very simple question, but which has a very, uh, actually, it's a hard to answer. But I hope you will answer this. Uh, question is the following. Why, despite of the great knowledge accumulated in the Italy by Italian scientists, why, despite of the wonderful this uh, structure which constructed government in Italy in terms of the uh, safety, in terms of the protection, civil and the constructions, despite of these things, we observe disasters and really violent disasters in Italy. And I could compare this disaster in relative sense with Haiti, but not with Japan. Because only 10% uh, maximum uh, people who suffered or who passed away in Japan were related to earthquakes and to the physical vulnerability. Others came because of the uh, tsunami, similarly in Chile. It was only about the 500 people, mostly because of tsunami. Is it the problem of the, what, what is the missing chain here in this construction. Why we cannot, as previous uh, uh, person mentioned, they say prevent it in advance. Yeah. Because it's, we know that Umbria Marche region is a very seismically active. And there are many buildings which are over and over uh, aged, I would tell. And it is a, some type of the prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so I, I, I believe you, you are not referring just to the cultural heritage, but uh, in general, you are, you mean, okay. <coughs> uh, it's uh, a simple and, uh, and uh, complex uh, answer. <coughs> you, you mentioned three, uh, two countries, uh, Japan and uh, Chile, and uh, which are uh, totally different from Italy for what concerns hazards and for, for what concerns constructions. You know that Italy is a, a very ancient, uh, uh, from the point of view of civilization country, and uh, we have uh, old buildings everywhere, uh, 200, 300, 500, uh, uh, 1,000 years old buildings. <coughs> uh, it's not the same in Chile. Moreover, uh, the uh, number of earthquakes, the, the return period of important earthquake in Chile is of the over of two, three years in the same place, not the same in Italy. In Italy, we have uh, every 200, 300. So the uh, memory of, uh, of man uh, is lost uh, after, you know, after 10 years, 20 years. <coughs> and uh, so uh, th there is not uh, uh, a continuous, uh, let's say, alert for people to take prevention uh, countermeasure. There is a, a big question, uh, the, the big problem is the money needed to strengthen uh, this big amount of uh, buildings that, are, uh, that, should, uh, that, that, that needs uh, uh, strengthening. Uh, for what concerns Japan, uh, that was mentioned also the Kobe earthquake. So it depends on uh, where the earthquake occurs. In Italy, we have, uh, we have this, uh, it's a county which is very densely populated in uh, uh, seismic prone areas. So the, the, the question is complex. If now we decide to invest money on the, uh, on the reduction of seismic risk, uh, apart from cultural heritage, but in, in general for the uh, total building stock, we would need some uh, some hundreds of uh, billion of euros, 200, 300, 400, depends on the level of uh, safety that you want to reach. And uh, this is not for the moment in the agenda of, uh, uh, of uh, politics. That is typically of the order of 
one year, two years, five years. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, uh, there is no time to, for more questions. Let us go ahead to the third uh, presentation by Georgia. Thank you, Dr. Dol Dolce. Uh, the presentation by Georgia uh, Chesaro from UNESCO will be entitled The UNESCO Seek Stability Program Through Natural Hazard Risk Mitigation in Petra. And um, it is important to say that Georgia is a heritage conservation and management specialist with experience in heritage documentation and interpretation, heritage policy and legislation, and culture as a tool for cultural, for socioeconomic development, the same of mine. Since uh, 2010, she works at the UNESCO Office of Amman as responsible for projects related to the conservation and management of World Heritage Sites, specifically at the Petra Archaeological Park, including the development of disaster risk reduction approaches and risk management strategies at heritage sites. She is also involved in supporting the government of Jordan in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention for Jordan World Heritage and tentative list sites. Uh, a lot to, to, to be said about uh, Georgia, but uh, I, uh, during the last four years, I get used to work almost uh, daily with Georgia, and I know how much uh, she is committed to her work, and uh, I'm interested to, to listen for more about uh, the Sikh Stability Project. Please, Georgia. Thank you, Dr. Jamhawi, for the introduction. I'm actually very honored to be here today among these distinguished professors. Uh, my, my experience in CV, I think, is much shorter, but uh, uh, I'm here to, uh, to present, I would say, a case study um, related to Jordan um, and related to Petra, uh, which uh, brings, uh, which is related to prevention and mitigation. We've been tackling this topic in the previous this presentation, so here is a more um, close approach uh, that deals with uh, case studies from this country. Um, as it was mentioned uh, before, Petra is a, is a war heritage site, it's located about 250 kilometers from uh, Amman in the south of Jordan. It was described in the World Heritage List in 1985. And uh, uh, due to its uh, outstanding universal values that relate uh, to its specific uh, uh, archaeological heritage, uh, it's, a, it's a site built by the ancient uh, uh, Nabataeans. Uh, but it's also uh, unique uh, due to its uh, geology, uh, which makes also mm, part of its fragility and uh, uh, makes it important for, uh, for us to focus on its uh, preservation. So it's uh, vulnerable to hydrogeological hazards and like rockfalls, earthquakes, floods, but also is vulnerable due to the uh, use of the site by visitors. So here I will focus uh, uh, mainly on the natural hazards. Uh, so uh, Petra is located in a water basin. So uh, all the uh, wadi beds uh, surrounding the site merge in, uh, in Petra and mainly in, uh, in the sea. Um, and uh, as you can see here, uh, there are flash flood events that uh, happen uh, regularly every year during the rainy seasons from November to April. Um, this, uh, of course, the site is also subject to earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes have been responsible for the fall of uh, some of the heritage sites there of the Nabataean temples. Uh, this is an example taken from uh, the Great Temple in Petra. Um, and also here there is a, a recurrence, uh, which is uh, for the strongest earthquakes uh, of about 100 years. The last one was, uh, they, dates back to 1927. Um, and also rock falls. Uh, here are some examples taken from the site. Um, it, there is not a detailed uh, historical record of rock falls. Uh, the only one that it was, uh, it could be 
um, recorded is the one of 1954 because there was a previous documentation in the beginning of the century. Uh, the others are more recent and uh, were documented also in the framework of our project and by other uh, heritage professionals. So as, as UNESCO, uh, a man office, uh, we um, feel that it's a UNESCO mandate uh, to uh, protect uh, heritage sites, uh, especially as Petra, and uh, this is uh, a, um, a field that uh, uh, integrates both uh, cultural sector aspects and scientific aspects that are both part of what UNESCO works on. So. Um, it is for this reason that our office has been working in Petra in terms of risk management since uh, uh, 2009. Uh, here is a summary of the main initiatives that were carried out and are still ongoing. Uh, we started with a preliminary risk assessment in 2011 that was um, targeting the whole site and then we've moved and we concentrated on one specific area which is the SEEK. Why we are working in the SIG is because uh, this is a, a unique uh, geological and cultural site. So it's a 1.2 kilometer long gorge that connects uh, the entrance of the site uh, to the prominent uh, tomb of the treasury. Uh, but this is a natural site, so it was digged by the waters of the Wadi Musa through centuries. So this exposed the site to a number of natural uh, uh, risks, uh, natural hazards, and it also makes it very vulnerable because of the presence of tourists that are passing through the site on a daily basis. Uh, so here you have some images also of the cultural aspects uh, of, the, of the site, uh, where you can see Nabatian channels on the two sides of the gorge. Um, and uh, uh, an image from laser scanning model. So uh, our uh, program started uh, back in 2009 when uh, the blockhead you can see on, on the right hand side developed a crack um, the, uh, that due to water infiltrations mainly and uh, uh, required intervention. This, it, it was the first time that uh, uh, something like this was recorded uh, in the SIG. Um, so uh, uh, UNESCO supported the government of Jordan uh, through the expertise of one uh, Italian engineering geologist who uh, uh, started uh, um, and the technical committee was established to find out what to do and this ended, ended up with the, con the, the consolidation of the block that was carried out in 2011 and 24 micropiles have been um, installed uh, in order to connect the block to the rock block. And uh, this, uh, we tried to do this uh, uh, also uh, taking into account the conservation of the site. So uh, this is actually an intervention that's not uh, very, uh, very visible at the moment when you will pass in the, in the SIG. So um, after that, a rapid assessment of the SIG was carried out and then from 2012, uh, a, the SIG stability project started and the project is funded by the uh, Italian Development uh, Cooperation. Um, to give you an idea of the, of the type of, uh, uh, of phenomena uh, that can happen in the SIG, uh, you, you see um, uh, toppling cases on the left side, uh, uh, sliding and rock falls. Phenomena, this type of phenomena um, involve blocks of different sizes, uh, from large to medium and small. Uh, mm, some example of recent rockfall events, uh, one from 2009 uh, located, uh, and one in 2015, they're both located in the vicinity of the Kamen Monument, in any case it's a very touristic area where uh, tourists tend normally uh, watching uh, a um, <coughs> watching the monument, so uh, it's very, very risky. So uh, through the first phase of the project that was uh, uh, in implemented from 2012 to 2015, uh, we looked with the uh, project partners, uh, first of all, at carrying out uh, for documentation of the site through laser scanning, panoramic photography, and by creating a GIS uh, uh, platform. Uh, this is to give you an idea of what was done. It was very challenging because the landscape is complex, so the documentation is not very easy. Uh, this 
is an example of panoramic photography, laser scanning, uh, and the digital terrain model. Um, this was very useful then to identify the best uh, uh, integrated uh, monitoring system that could be installed on site in order to monitor uh, the, um, the movement uh, uh, of blocks in the most hazardous areas. Uh, we used uh, satellite radar interferometry, uh, topographic monitoring through uh, a total station, um, TM, like a TM30, and then wireless uh, techniques and digital digital terrestrial photogrammetry. I would just mention here in more detail the two techniques that proved to be more effective. Uh, so the topographic monitoring um, that implied the installation of 64 micro prisms on the, on the seek walls. It was the first time that uh, climbers were allowed uh, to climb on site um, and uh, install uh, monitoring systems. Uh, these uh, uh, prisms have been installed in uh, areas that were considered more hazardous, but at the same time stable enough to allow monitoring uh, uh, every few uh, weeks. Uh, this is the detail of the installation, and this is the wireless monitoring system instead, which is comprised of uh, six uh, uh, devices installed uh, in big blocks um, uh, in different sectors of the site. The, the devices uh, are connected uh, to uh, temperature and humidity sensors that then um, send uh, the information to re through the repeaters to a gateway where all the information, all the data are collected. Uh, uh, this is the installation of the repeater and this is an example of the wire extensometer inst inst installed in one block and the tilt meter to measure different type of movement. Uh, one uh, device is also installed on the right hand side of the treasury. So and this is the gateway where all the information is collected. Then the data are on a cloud and through an, an interface it's possible to monitor the uh, movements, uh, potential movements of the selected blocks. Um, this type of uh, techniques uh, were uh, implemented for three years, uh, um, data were gathered, and this uh, helped us identifying uh, uh, priorities. Uh, what, uh, uh, what came out is that actually uh, the, the main blocks uh, that were monitored uh, uh, were not uh, mm, that hazardous as it was initially thought. Uh, but the uh, highest risk was represented by uh, the fall of small blocks from the uh, seek walls and the fall of debris uh, during uh, flash flood events. So during the second phase of the project, we concentrated on the implementation of mitigation measures that were addressing these two phenomena mainly, uh, together with uh, other activities. So first of all, the site documentation was completed with a drone survey uh, of the site that helped uh, finalizing the inventory uh, of situation on the site, together with uh, uh, the documentation of the upper seek that was not documented during the phase one, that was divided into sections and uh, uh, forms were created ad hoc for the um, gathering of all the data related to geological and archeological uh, aspects. Um, and this was the basis uh, f before the start of the implementation of, uh, um, of the intervention. So first of all, the debris removal from the upper seek that we call cleaning, it was implemented um, in the spring 2016. And it uh, comprised of different interventions from cleaning, debris terracing, relocation of blocks that were on the edge of the seek, but also small stabili stabilization of small blocks, uh, remodeling of blocks, and uh, water diversion. Um, then we moved uh, on the slopes and with the same climbers that had installed the monitoring devices previously, they are Jordanian climbers, uh, we removed small blocks from the seek walls. Um, this operation took about a month and it was very successful because then monitoring was carried out soon after to verify uh, the implementation of the activities and the results. But in parallel, uh, we carried out also uh, awareness uh, uh, following an awareness strategy that we had developed uh, in the beginning of the project. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the awareness was tackling different uh, uh, stakeholders at different levels, uh, so from uh, uh, side business beneficiaries, but also uh, the civil defense, uh, uh, the tourism police, uh, and um, 
through workshops that were carried out uh, before the implementation of the activities to the awareness activities on site uh, addressed mainly to visitors um, during which we were distributing brochures to make them aware of the project and uh, uh, youth from the local community um, in coordination with the Petra National Trust. Um, we also continued uh, with the implementation of the monitoring, uh, the wireless monitoring system that proved to be the most useful monitoring uh, device in system installed on site. We moved from the natural alert uh, interface to IASA um, that allowed uh, the uh, incorporation of different type of data uh, and uh, the development also in the future of a risk index. Uh, that's something we're working on at the moment. Um, as one of the main uh, results of this phase of the project, uh, from the scientific point of view, is the, uh, derived uh, from the analysis of the data gathered, is this, the connection between uh, uh, the variation in temperature and uh, rockfalls uh, uh, on site, uh, based on an analysis of, of the uh, temperature data gathered through the devices installed on site, uh, it was possible to determine that the rockfall happened in 2015, uh, happening on a day where there was a, a temperature difference of 15 degrees between the day and the night. And uh, the experts working on the project could identify how this same phenomenon had happened also in the uh, previous cases in 2009, 2010, and 2016 by correlating the data, temperature data, rainfall data, and uh, uh, the evidence on, on the ground. Now we are still working on the project. This is the third phase. Um, and during this phase of implementation, uh, we are moving into uh, addressing uh, uh, mitigation interventions that involve uh, blocks of bigger size. So if we look at the landslide uh, uh, mitigation process, we are in uh, uh, phase six. Uh, so uh, based on uh, the development of a feasibility study addressing uh, blocks of big size that was carried out at the end of the second phase of the project, it was possible to identify uh, about 11 cases uh, that are considered priority for intervention um, all along the top of the seek. So uh, no, uh, it, 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 as you can see, uh, the type of works is different. Uh, so there is dislodgement, consolidation, uh, installation of anchors. Uh, but uh, um, it is the first time that this kind of work uh, uh, works happen uh, uh, in the SIC because uh, it's very different from 2009, 2011. In this case, the blocks are located uh, on the upper parts of the site. And this involves uh, a number of measures that need to be implemented to ensure the safety of the tourists that are passing uh, regularly on site. Because I forgot to mention that we, we, we work, while we work, the site is open for visitors. Uh, so, and it's not possible to close the site. Um, so in, uh, in a few weeks' time, we will start working on the sites uh, that are um, um, underlined in, uh, in, in, in red on the map. Um, and this will be a new, a new challenge. <laughs> Hopefully, we will be able to succeed. Um, so uh, I'm, I know I don't have much time. So just to conclude, uh, I think that the, the project uh, has been in the program uh, because uh, this has been lasting since uh, uh, about uh, eight years now, uh, has been successful because thanks to uh, the, um, the results achieved, uh, we could um, develop a, a, a number of data that can be used for the management of the site. So it is also in this case an integrated approach trying to apply uh, what developed for the wider management of the site, which is something uh, our office is working on as well. We are developing a risk management plan, a management plan for the whole site of Petra, which includes also a risk management plan. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the cleaning that, uh, that we did 
uh, can ensure an increased uh, uh, safety for the tourists uh, who pass by regularly. And, uh, and also, we are trying to maintain active the wireless monitoring system, despite several episodes of vandalism, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the collection of data continues and mm, that it's, it would be possible to develop a risk index that can be used by the local authorities to prevent as much as possible um, rock falls. Um, and all the data that have been gathered uh, can be useful for other projects and other activities on site. It is important to integrate experiences and this is not always the case. So we hope that our work will benefit other, uh, other uh, offices and other institutions. Um, it's very important uh, to, for us, it was very important to understand how rock falls can be uh, correlated to temper temperature fluctuation. So I will stop here. I just want to acknowledge all the people who participated in the project uh, uh, until now um, and, uh, and the institutions. Uh, and I wish to thank you very much. If you want to have more information, you can find some videos on YouTube, both on the um, risk mitigation measures applied and the awareness activities. Uh, and also we have a, a Facebook page and our uh, web page of the UNESCO MANO office. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. And for me, because I'm fam well familiar m with this project, but uh, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to show uh, what has been achieved till now over the last uh, eight years. And uh, maybe I know that uh, you miss uh, thanking the <laughs> sponsors, <laughs> uh, mainly the Italian government who sponsored the, uh, this project. And thanks to those who were joining the project in the first phase, first PNT and Celtic, who already uh, uh, achieved or helped us in making some achievements in terms of local awareness for the locals to, to understand the importance of this project first and to be enthusiastic in some of them in sharing and working uh, uh, or uh, in joining the training that needs kind of special special uh, skills in climbing and uh, then I have to say that we at the Department of Equities deal with this project as a significant project in terms of its kind. This is our first project of its kind that deals with a, pr a real conservation work uh, uh, as a disaster mitigation uh, project and we are preparing with the UNESCO the file or the uh, uh, yes the file of this project to be submitted for the competition of the best practice projects in ECROM so we hope that we will we will uh, be awarded I will open the floor uh, for uh, for questions doctor as as you are one of the locals should be given the priority doctor Sleiman please thank you Georgia for uh, a very um, clear and up to the point uh, presentation. I really, as Dr. Munder mentioned, maybe first of all as a, a local and uh, someone who's really concerned about uh, risks around, I would love to thank you and to thank the UNESCO and all partners uh, involved in this project. And you can see how uh, unique is Petra and how, I mean, the whole area about conservation, protection in Petra and the rocky areas completely different from built heritage, which needs certain type of care. And uh, my, it's a kind of comment maybe more than a question. It's about the need to sustain such a project. That's exactly the point in terms of having it in the long term, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is something that uh, needs uh, really detailed work, technical work, but also know-how and also the need for building capacity in the region. Uh, because I remember, uh, for example, in the 80s when the Germans worked in the uh, uh, conservation and restoration of some of the facades, and the idea at that time of having a specialized center to educate the locals, and uh, the whole idea then vanished and didn't uh, continue. 
So I hope that, uh, I think that the current even circumstances are completely different and the awareness uh, around uh, Petra and its value is becoming more visible uh, amongst all parties. So what we need to think about is really about sustainability of this project in the long run and I can imagine that's also one of your concerns. Thank you. Uh, if I may respond yes, quickly, uh, yes, thank you very much for the comment because uh, given the, uh, the short time I was given for the presentation, I maybe forgot to, to mention that uh, actually capacity building is one of the, the key uh, points of the project. Uh, we have been doing this mainly in the second phase and currently in the third phase. We also developed a sustainability plan that has been uh, presented to our um, partners, uh, the Department of Antiquities and the Petra Archaeological Park, which are actually the persons that I forgot to mention. I mentioned the donors, but I didn't, I forgot to mention <laughs> the national authorities. Uh, so um, uh, this is very important, we know that. It's very difficult to sustain such a, an activity in the long term. So we are trying to build the capacities locally. Uh, the, um, uh, we carried out uh, climbing uh, trainings. Uh, it, it might seem uh, weird because, uh, as you know, the local probably know the local community in Petra. Uh, they, are, they are natural climbers, but uh, this is not done uh, safely, and is not done following certain procedures, and is not related to block dislodgement. Uh, so uh, this is what we try to transfer in terms of uh, capacities. Uh, uh, the end point would be for them to be able to implement uh, this uh, operation on their own, but this would be a very long process, uh, probably a 10-year process that uh, will entail also the acquisition of uh, uh, certain um, skills uh, that are related to a specific education, education engineering, geology that uh, is not... Uh, uh, can't be found every in, in Jordan that easily. So the uh, intervention of international partners uh, that is very uh, present at the moment uh, should progressively uh, leave and uh, ensure the sustainability. But this, uh, again, uh, given the, the scientificity of this project, will, uh, will take quite some time, yes. M may I add, uh, Georgia, if you allow me, because the sustainability, uh, the sustainability of the of, the, of caring of the, the, the site is not only the project or the UNESCO responsibility, rather it's, it's the DOE and the BTDRA and the BAP, which is the Petra Archaeological Park uh, uh, responsibility. And actually we were discussing a few days ago this issue, how to uh, initiate a system, a sustainable system that includes locals who should be uh, appointed and uh, they know their process without telling them what to do and without even um, pushing them or they, there should be systematic and regular uh, work by, by local team who should be appointed for this because this is a very, very critical and important. Uh, Your Royal Highness, I, I, I think you, you need to say something, please. I actually <coughs> have a technical question. I was <laughs> curious. Uh, when you said that uh, the rockfall is associated with the temperature difference. Mm -hmm. So have you identified the factors that are, so you said not rainfall specifically, but temperature difference, yes. but are there other factors, seismic activity, uh, you know, what, wind activity, and then are there, will you develop a scientific indice or indices of these factors that can then be predictive of rockfall eventually, or, and can that be taken and apply to other areas and on other monuments, or is it specific to sandstone and, and the geology of Petra? Thank you for the question, Your Royal Highness. This is very interesting. In fact, so far, the, the data that uh, we have uh, are related to the temperature difference only. Uh, it was interesting to see, uh, and the, the experts who are part of the project worked uh, a lot on this, uh, that it was not the, the rain uh, to influence uh, the rockfalls. Uh, that's a triggering effect for blocks that are already dislodged. So this is why all the, the cleaning operations are, should be uh, repeated regularly every year so that before the rainy season. So this is, uh, there is uh, of course, uh, this reduces the risk. Uh, but for the big block or uh, certain situations that cannot even be monitored regularly through our uh, systems, it's mainly the temperature difference only. 
Yes, and for the um, risk index, uh, this is uh, related again to this, uh, to the temperature difference only. And we, mm, but uh, through the application that I showed, we're trying to integrate also other data that are coming from the manual monitoring system that was installed in the first phase uh, uh, to integrate uh, the data. But the most important uh, a factor in this case is the temperature so far, yes. <laughs> The geology, yes, this can be applied. This, uh, this, these are data related to Petra, so I would not uh, risk to say that this is applicable uh, anywhere else. So Petra, but not only the SIC, because the geology, wherever the geology of Petra uh, is similar to the one of, uh, of the SIC, of course, and uh, this uh, is connected also to one of the achievements of the project, because the project is focusing on the SIC because there is a highest vulnerability there um, due to tourism presence, but uh, due to the, to the specific specific shape of the seek, which is very narrow and has very high walls. But uh, I in fact, this phenomena happen everywhere in, uh, in, on the site. Uh, so it's just the site is too broad to be able to address all of them or for the local authorities to uh, invest on, on this. Uh, thank you very much. OK, uh, please. OK, it's just probably a continuation to this question. Uh, so you showed at the beginning several treats to this wonderful site which I visited just uh, two days ago and I enjoyed very much because it was a, uh, it is for us, for humanity actually to enjoy this uh, site, cultural and natural site. And do you consider in the future to also uh, use such kind of the wonderful experience which you now collected for the, uh, let's say, uh, rock sliding, uh, but also for to understand it, the how protection can be done in terms of the uh, flash flooding or in terms of the, for example, uh, the salt domes rising, etc. Because I was observing it's how it's the salt it is just extruded, as you know, in this, it's, it's a fantastic areas and actually geological as well. And another thing is related to UNESCO. As you know, the UNESCO uh, Earth Science and the Disaster Risk Reduction section has several programs. One of them, for example, International Landslide Consortium mm -hmm. Program, another International Geoscience Program, and specifically geohazards are inside. Yes. And that is uh, important to probably use these also links to bring attention to this region uh, at even higher uh, <laughs> levels uh, in UNESCO. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, so concerning your uh, second point, um, yes, thank you very much for pointing this out. Uh, we have presented a project at the World Landslide uh, Forum this year in uh, Ljubljana. Um, but uh, of course, we uh, we're very interested in uh, building and integrating this knowledge also with the earth science sector because uh, it's uh, it's an, there is a lot of overlapping and actually we are expanding from the cultural sector into the earth science one. So thank you for for, for mentioning this. Um, concerning your your first question, um, uh, I'm not sure I, I understood it uh, uh, completely. Uh, you 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 were mentioning. Uh, this, if this kind of, uh, of hazard can can happen also in other in other areas of the of the site and how this can be addressed, am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. The, the experience that we acquired working in the sea can be, of course, uh, replicated in other uh, in other areas of the site, and this is, uh, um, uh, of course, a priority. And it would be our interest to expand the program also. Uh, beyond the SIG, uh, but uh, uh, I think we work in coordination with the, with the national authorities, so uh, it, it, it has to be a shared uh, priority and plan. Um, but um, yes, of course, we are working on also on flash floods. We are aiming at developing um, a disaster risk management plan for the, for the SIG specifically, uh, which can be part of a risk management plan of the site. Uh, in, in the case of the Petra region, uh, where Petra is located, there are some regulatory frameworks, but for the site itself, there are none. So yes, we're looking into other kind of hazards as well, uh, but we focus on what uh, seem to be the, the priority. Um, and uh, there is an integration with flash floods as well. So if we go back to, to what we discussed in the beginning, uh, what Dr. Rohit presented, yes, uh, there should be um, uh, multiple hazard risk assessment carried out on, uh, on the site to be able to, to tackle all of these challenges. 
Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Georgia. And it's almost uh, done. <laughs> Is there possible? Please. Please. Thank you very much, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. As a recent visitor to Petra of only a few days ago, from all the way from Australia, I have to ask you um, a personal opinion you have of the Nabataeans. Were they amazing um, hydrologists? Um, yeah. Do you have an opinion on the, them from the, the answer work? is yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think here there are uh, distinguished archaeologists in the room that will be able to answer this question better than me. But of course, the evidence shows that they were extremely uh, good hydrologists. I couldn't delve into that in the presentation. But in fact, uh, if we go back, let me see if there is a good slide that can show that. But yeah, maybe I can focus on this. But at the entrance of the sick, the Nabataeans managed to divert the waters to make sure that waters were not uh, flooding on the site and they were diverted all around this mountainous area and coming to the center of the site, which is there where there is the, the, the Roman city now. Uh, this kind of techniques uh, uh, is not there at the moment. Uh, I mean, the, the tunnel was uh, where the, the, the waters were diverted has been rehabilitated, but there are also many other interventions that should be carried out also in terms of water storage facilities because there are uh, cisterns uh, everywhere on site, all these uh, mountainous spot, uh, the uh, uh, higher parts uh, to collect the water and also uh, channel, channel systems. So. It's a, it's a complex system that, uh, to be effective again, uh, should be rehabilitated as a whole. And this, uh, so far, has not been done. There are recent projects that are looking into uh, Nabataean terraces, uh, because in these areas, uh, on the top of the sea, and oh no, I don't have the point, I don't have the point there, sorry. Uh, here, um, the, the Nabataeans has also, um, build terraces uh, and agricultural lands that could absorb the water to prevent it from falling down in the sea. This is not there anymore and this is why uh, when it's flooding the water comes from all sides of the sea, not only from the entrance but also from the top. Uh, so definitely, I mean, we wish uh, we could apply the same uh, techniques uh, used by this uh, wonderful ancient civilization <laughs> uh, to protect the site. We, we, it's uh, also here what is important, and was mentioned by my colleagues before, is the coordination between different institutions, uh, different projects uh, to address all together these problems. Uh, we, we started, there are other people, there is uh, another project uh, now looking into Navatian terraces, uh, and we are trying to integrate uh, the data collected, uh, but there is much more to be done. Uh, this is a huge site, 264 square kilometers. So, Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Georgia, and thank you for thank attending. You.